seems to be working. Okay, we'll go with that then. All right, I will do the spiel at the beginning. Uh, by the way, is there any, any particular way you would like to be introduced? Or? I mean, a PhD candidate in Dublin City University is probably um, the safest option. Um, as I know the history hack people tend to mention the stand-up comedy, but I don't know if this, <laughs> I mean, feel free, I, I don't mind, uh, but I think the, the PhD candidate, and also I, I, I am technically, my, my, I have an IRC scholarship, so that adds a bit of clout to it as well, so cool. I, I guess they're the important things. So uh, PhD candidate at Devon University, do you want to go with City that? University. Seven City University. <laughs> I think, no, you, you correct me if I get it wrong, because because I have after this truly embarrassing thing the last couple of episodes, I've, I've politely asked people how they want to be introduced. They've told me. Then I do the spiel, get to it, realize I have forgotten completely <laughs> what they want me to say, and just garble it horribly. So, well, yeah, okay, so, right, right. Uh, welcome back once again, ladies and gentlemen, to this strange corner of the internet called the Adventures in History Land YouTube channel. Today, today, St. Patrick's Day of all days, actually, uh, we are joined by a friend of mine from from the, the universe of the internet, uh, fellow pixelated uh, vet veteran of the pixelated battlefield of total wars, <laughs> and um, just an all-round good guy. Uh, Andrew Dorman, who is also a PhD candidate at Dublin City University. <laughs> Got it right that time. Well, I'm just owning it, guys. I'm terrible at introducing people. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I think you nailed it. Yeah. Okay, it's, excellent. It's, it's interesting how this lockdown has just thrust historians into a ball. <laughs> it's like, oh, we're all, <laughs> some of these are nice people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not too scary in person. But uh, today, very appropriately, I think you will be able to regain back uh, your Irish passport after having had to, to talk about the British Army uh, with Marcus and, uh, and the rest of us a few days ago. Uh, because we're going to talk about the, the in quote, wild geese of the French Army, uh, the, the Brigade Yolande, uh the Irish Brigade. That's yes. right, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk about the Irish Brigade, and the legendary Waterloo of the 18th century, the Battle of Fontenoy in 1745, which is, as you will see, one of the coolest, if you can call a battle cool, battles in, in, his, in military history. Yeah, definitely so, underrated for sure. If Again, if you can underrate, you know, the wounding and killing of thousands of people. But, however, that's, that's what military historians do, right? It is what it is. They were all slightly psychopathic. Yeah. Um, Softly psychopathic below the surface, for, you know. I guess uh, you get you're raised on toy soldiers and video games, and you know, this is what happens. Uh, the I was going to say something that made sense a minute ago, and I forgot what it was going to be. But basically speaking, I'm trying to decide where to start. Should I just should I just throw at you where do the Irish brigades come from? And why are they fighting for the French? Yeah, how's, how's that to start off with? We could start there. Um, well, the Irish have a, a long history of selling our swords. Uh, that is not a euphemism. Um, uh, to anyone, really, the highest bidder. Uh, I think you're talking uh, first real, I suppose, professional, if you want to call it that service, is probably with Spain. Um, in the early modern period, anyway, uh, you have several tercios there, like the O'Neill Tercio, that gathers a lot of uh, prestige. Uh, in the 17th century and they were part of the original i guess flight of the earls which took place uh after uh we got our uh we were defeated at the battle of yellow ford <laughs> um i was going to use a slightly less <laughs> appropriate term for that um However, in French service, it's a different story because uh, Ireland and France, uh, I suppose we don't share the old alliance that the Scots do, but there is a mutual understanding of having a aggressive next door neighbor. Uh, if, if you want to put it like that. And the origins of the Irish Brigade and French service begin in the, the Williamite Wars, which, uh, as you know, uh, is an extension of the War of the League of Augsburg or the Nine Years' War or whatever war you <laughs> however you want to call it. Um, I'm sure that the Americans probably have a different name for it. <laughs> um, but 
I think they call it King's Will- King Will- King William's War or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, it's like the French Indian War versus Seven yeah. Years War. But, um, so the uh, at first the war does not go well for the Jacobite cause, and the Jacobite cause moves to Ireland. Uh, obviously, James flees before battle is. Uh, or takes place in, on English soil uh, because mm-hmm. obviously why have a fight in England when instead you could have it in Ireland not that I'm bitter uh, that is also a hyper- <laughs> <laughs> not, 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 not unfair at all I mean, I mean oh. it's, it's just completely fair I mean we could we could go into blaming John Churchill for completely abandoning his sovereign uh, and therefore making it moot to try and fight <laughs> but I mean he redeems himself later on by making the brigade look good so, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really ought to be more serious so the no, no, we, we come here for the laughs as well as the learns <laughs> okay In that case, I'll um, so uh, James flees to Ireland where a chap called uh, Talbot I believe the Talbot or Tyrconnell oh no I really don't know. It's one of the two. Can't remember off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Has uh, planted a lot of Catholic officers in high positions and has sort of re- recatholicized the army. And James essentially has a power base from which he could potentially reinvade England. William, not happy with this, decides to send an army after him. They clash at the Battle of the Boyne, which uh, obviously doesn't go particularly well for James. He runs off to Dublin afterwards, where famously he runs into a woman who says, oh my God, you're the king. And he says, yes, a battle is won and my army ran away, to which she replies, well, clearly his majesty has won the race, <laughs> um, which I guess is where he earns his nickname in Irish history. If you'll pardon the language, this is a direct quote, but James the shit. Um, he is not particularly fond, kind of fond of in Irish history here. Um, and he... As a result of these initial failings and the war very much going south, despite the efforts of individuals like Patrick Sarsfield and the like, who are very interesting characters in their own right, uh, Louis offers a exchange of soldiers being negotiated by a man called the Comte de Vaux. So de Vaux comes to Ireland, he sees the Irish fighting, and he thinks, okay, we, we need to help out here, and some of these guys may not make the worst soldiers in the world. So they negotiate that 3,000 Irishmen will be shipped to France in exchange for about the same number. I think it's three to 5,000 French who will then join um, the Jacobite army in Ireland. Uh, the French in Ireland fight quite well. Uh, I mean, Ockram is only really lost when the French commander gets his head blown off, uh, I think it would be fair to say. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the whole, it's it's a fairly positive exchange for both. And those three regiments that are shipped over are... I believe you've definitely got Claire. He's one of the first. Uh, Lee and Dylan, I believe. Uh, They're the initial three, although I could be wrong about Dylan. And these three regiments go to France, and they are distinct from the proper flight of the wild geese that comes afterwards. And this is a very important distinction and nuance that's often uh, confused. So... When James eventually loses, he flees to France and his army is told to follow him as part of the Treaty of Limerick. Uh, and this is what's known as the Flight of the Wild Geese. And you have an Irish army in France. So this is the distinction. You have Irishmen in, French, in the French army and then an Irish army in France. And that is often where people trip over uh, themselves. But in the interim, before sort of this Irish army, which includes people like this Patrick Sarsfield chap who I mentioned earlier and others. Uh, they fight in Flanders for a little while, but their military career is somewhat cut short and they're kind of folded into the French army. But the actual Irish brigade in French service begins its career quite poorly, it's safe to say. DeVoe, when he sees the soldiers coming off the boats, describes them as some of the worst soldiers he's ever seen. He says they're too weak, they have no equipment. The, we need to either help these people or get rid of them. <laughs> and, <laughs> The War of the Spanish Secession, I suppose, gives them an opportunity to actually perform and show that they do have some combat prowess. So I guess that's that's the introduction. Yeah. Okay. It's probably a little, a little bit long winded, but we got there in the end. I mean, that's that's under ten minutes. That's pretty good, to be honest. We're quite an in depth subject, I think. So you know, pat on the back there, man. I couldn't have done it that well. Um, so we get to the uh, War of the Spanish Succession, and are the are the are the sort of the two Irish forces, military forces within France sort of resolved into one by now? Yes. Um, yeah. James's sort of crus- not crusade, but his efforts yeah, well. to invade, he realises that he can't do it without French support. So it's yeah. they're kind of consolidated into one another. Um, 
And I've, I've just remembered it wasn't Dylan, it was Mount Cashel. He was one of the first to go to go over, but that's just my own editing in my own brain. Um, we'll keep that in then. So, people... yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, the, they've consolidated into one another and it's fairly, sta they follow the French system of uh, sort of company and battalion size. It, there's no sort of distinction there. They're paid slightly less, uh, I think. I think it's maybe 70% or 75% wage in total. It's obviously the Swiss are paid a little bit more and then uh, <laughs> French regiment, and then Irish and Germans, I think. Are yeah, I mean, more. if you can get the Swiss, then of course you pay them more because what's well, the Swiss? So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no one knows, right? <laughs> it's, in, it's in the contract. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, they got the Pope and the guard, they're in the guard and stuff like that. So it's just only, it's just, um, just the way it goes. But interestingly enough, I, you do know, you will notice that the um, Irish Brigade in Fr French service um, do wear red, which yeah. is not necessarily like a red coat thing, because uh, the red, you know, the regular line infantry of France wears white, and the only other troops that wear red are guard regiments in a way yeah. that's that is that my that could be an interesting distinction <laughs> yeah but, um I, I think that it, it's a jacobite legacy because they still believe they're fighting for the true king hmm. so they want to sort of tie themselves to that and the, the flags they wave are concerningly english i suppose if you're on the <laughs> battlefield you're going to get confused i mean yes there are harps in the corners but at the same time it's <laughs> <laughs> this is true i'm thinking i think it's the, the, the best the best known one is probably Dylan's, uh, Dylan's flag, which is the red and black one. Which what is it in, in this sign? Conquer written on it or something like that. Yeah. A bit of yeah. bit of Constantine there. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's cross and then the facing color. So mm -hmm. uh, usually, I think green, as you said, was Dylan. Um, Claire had yellow, um, and then there was a, I mean Mount Cashel. I think was maybe buff or. Oh. or Black, maybe I, I I can't remember the exact face. No, 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 this is way too in depth for, just, for like a video thing. We you can go and look it up if you want to actually paint them. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, but so um, are they still mostly Irish at this point? Are they like officered Irish Jacobites and stuff like that? And 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 with that in mind, if that's the case, how do the French recruit them? Right. So. Are they Irish? Yes, um, for the most part. But at this early stage, absolutely. And at first, it, they're not really viewed as much, um, and they, they they struggle with recruitment initially. However, once they start succeeding on the battlefield, particularly at Cremona, well, that's the first big incident where they actually you know achieve something um, in their shirts and under under <laughs> underwear, um, fighting off it's Eugene of Savoy. I think at Cremona, perhaps. I would think it would probably have to be, yeah, because I don't think Marlborough got that far down. Yeah. Um, so he's, I mean, that's that's a fairly impressive battle honor mm -hmm. to have. Um, but how do they recruit them? Through alcohol, primarily. <laughs> um, it's it, obviously that they would do want to maintain the homogeneity, and there is a appetite for it in Ireland because although. James uh, James wasn't necessarily the most popular. They do feel that a Catholic monarch would be better in their service. Because remember, at this time, of course, Ireland is predominantly Catholic, being ruled by a Protestant majority, who have just implemented the penal laws. And at the, I don't want to get too sucked into this rabbit hole, because God knows, I'll never come out. But mm -hmm. the penal laws are put in place primarily to prevent a Catholic uprising. So they disarm the Catholics. It's not, they're not allowed to join the army, take away their horses. It's um, demilitarization. That being said, they're young men with not much to do and farming can only, you know, feed so many and they're bored. So mm -hmm. they want to fight. And the Irish regiments abroad offered this opportunity to do that. But obviously recruitment is illegal. So it's very sort of cloak and dagger clandestine. You're told if you go to this pub on this day, there might be an officer there. And they basically... Um, they take the equivalent, I guess, of the king's shilling, if you want a metaphor, and they, they drink to it. Uh, they drink to James's health often, or Louis <laughs> in some cases. And they're told, go to this location, there will be a boat, and you will be taken to France. It's very, they're putting a lot of trust here, and some of them are really suspicious, and justifiably so. They pick on, 
is, uh, some of the recruiters are quite idealistic and they are genuinely looking for Jacobite supporters. Most are traditional recruiters and therefore not. Um, they pick on people who are described in the documentation as very, you know, mean spirited or just all around like weak or particularly stupid or mm -hmm. particularly prone to drunkenness. Um, mm -hmm. And in one case, uh, th th the general concern is that they'll be shipped to the West Indies. Um, not even for military service, they'll just be moved there. Uh, and I guess it, it, some kind of servitude awaits them. Mm -hmm. But in a, in a desperate bid to placate two, rec two of the recruits uh, who raise this concern, one of the officers uh, drinks his whiskey that he's, he's gotten from some of them and says, this will poison me if I'm lying to you. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not the best negotiation tactic, um, particularly with Irish whiskey. <laughs> but, I mean, it, I guess it, it must have worked, but they, they're then discovered by uh, a British officer by accident. And this is a really interesting uh, subject, how the recruitment was suppressed because there were some Williamite loyalists who would essentially, and this is like, I mean, a bit of a term here, but they rat out the recruiters. So mm -hmm. there's one fellow in particular who uh, is notorious for doing this. And when the recruiter and the barman who was hosting the recruiting session are brought to trial, the whole community come out and lambast this guy's character who turned them in saying this guy is a cheapskate, he has no honor, he is <laughs> everything like this, and just trying to undermine his case on his uh, personality. Because clearly they know that he is he has done this several times in the mm -hmm. past. So you have these intercommunity battles uh, taking place, just trying to get these men out of Ireland. Um, the British army that is in Ireland at this time does supply men to the uh, I suppose the stopping of this, but really it falls to sort of your revenue officers, your uh, those kind of civil administrator positions to stop them. And there's one incident where an officer is given a tip off saying there will be Irishmen boarding a ship here. Uh, he goes there, doesn't see anything, and he's walking back down the road and he bumps into someone who happens to have a, in his pocket a notebook filled with names that have recently been recruited. So he then assembles the guard, they go off, I think it was to Hoth, and they find 200 men there by complete fluke. Uh, they capture like 20 of them, because <laughs> the rest of them are killed. <laughs> and it's the 18th century, so it's yeah. like flintlocks and stuff. So <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Come back. No. <laughs> I'm over 100 yards away. Um, yeah. So it's it, it's it's a little bit um, catch the pigeon, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, wacky races. But at the same time, it's a serious issue for the Irish because they don't want they they essentially don't want to send lose men who are likely to come back and invade again. That's the big mm -hmm. concern that you will have a Catholic core army that will come and then people will rise up in sympathy with them. So it's a real problem. And for the French, obviously, they want to keep these Irish regiments well supplied uh, with Irishmen because they seem to be really good soldiers. So it's it's that give and take. And although throughout the century it does change, at, at the start anyway, that's kind of the situation. Interesting. And if, are the French actually sending Frenchmen or are they using Irish Jacobites? Uh, they use Irish officers in those regiments. So, so there also be quite a quite a red flag there. There's a French guy wandering <laughs> around the pubs. <laughs> well, that does happen at one stage. Uh -huh. In the 1730s, the French are told, uh, OK, fine, you can recruit Irish guys. I think that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, my overall arching European history here is a bit hazy, but there was a brief period when France and England were on good terms in the yeah. 1730s. What? Well, I, I think so, yeah. I mean, not as close as they were back um, before, when Charles II was around, but um, I think there was a, a brief moment when they weren't killing each other. <laughs> yeah, they were probably killing the Spanish instead. Yeah. Um, Jenkins here, maybe. The French are told, you can send recruiters over, They must give, you must give me their names, and they can recruit X number of people, and that's it. That's all you can do. Unfortunately, uh, this doesn't trickle down to local law enforcement. So the next few letters that are in the archive that I found uh, are all, dear sir, please let the officer out. He was doing it legally. Because <laughs> some of these really enthusiastic constables going, we caught a genuine French officer in uniform. He's an idiot, clearly. <laughs> So, a, a breakdown in communication there. And there's the occasional moral panic that uh, comes up as well. You have, uh, you know, oh, there's, there's people training and they're in white uniforms in the countryside. They're clearly French uh, and there is no such evidence of this. And you know, the army camps out in the field for two days waiting to catch them. And it's a waste of time. So, you know, the, it, it's always this ongoing what if 
but uh, as this century progresses, it kind of peters out and becomes less important. Because obviously you have the general or general increase in acceptance of Irish recruitment into the red coat, or sorry, British army. Uh, mm-hmm. So you've got a sort of supply demand issue there as well. So mm-hmm. it, it does trend downwards. Mm-hmm. Great stuff, by the way. Excellent, <laughs> excellent, 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 utter confusion and uh, clandestine. Uh, why does every why why does all of the whenever I have these conversations, it's like surely someone should have made a parody of this. This should be <laughs> hilarious. Uh, but uh, trying to yeah, uh, as a, the main character is a recruiter trying to trying to get guys out of out of Ireland to France. <laughs> It smacks a little bit of that Blackadder episode where they try and get the um, the French noble out from under the revolutionaries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh dear. But um, so, uh, how does the how does the Irish Brigade in French service kind of evolve through the 18th century from the moment where the French realise we're onto a good thing here? Uh, they obviously gain more uh, respect and prowess and and things like that. How does What's that about? How does that happen? Well, they, as they sort of per- participate in more battles and perform well in those battles, they gain more regiments. I suppose that's the big thing that changes. Uh, now, those regiments do sort of fold into one another, and they are absorbed into one another. But at the high point at Fontenoy, I think you're looking at six battalions, six regiments in total, uh, which is not insubstantial, and one dragoon regiment too. Oh. So you've got a fairly You've got I mean, a core there, I suppose. Yeah, Not a core the, in a military term, but a... <laughs> in the old, like old-fashioned, yeah, the old-fashioned, yeah. <laughs> old-fashioned way of saying it. But yeah. the, I mean, there was, um, uh, yeah, I mean, even yeah, because I'm remembering about the the forty-five, a bunch of Irish pickets turned up to fight with body Prince Charlie with the with the re- small amount of French troops that managed to get over, and also a regiment of. Uh, a re- there was a regiment of dragoons or something like that as well. They had um, breastplates and all sorts of stuff. But that's interesting. Yeah. So that's, I suppose, from a logistical point of view, that that's the, the main thing. Size fluctuates, but peaks in around the 1740s. Um, then, I suppose, from a prestige standpoint and capability standpoint, it, it, their, it, their formative years are the War of the Spanish Succession. So I mentioned Cremona. Uh, which is a surprise attack uh, where they, the Bavarians, yeah, I believe Bavarians, um, attack this town at night. Um, the, the defending officer rides out and manages to get himself captured again in his pajamas. But it's the Irish who, re- who secure the bridges and drive them back. And, you know, I think they lower the, they raise the drawbridge or something heroic like that. And there's a mm-hmm. particular Irish officer, I think an O'Mahony, uh, who covers himself in glory. Um, capturing an officer or something so these mm. stories begin to filter back but really uh, i suppose if you're going to talk about war of the spanish secession it defaults to blenheim and mm-hmm. even in that defeat claire's regiment in particular comes out of it quite well when it comes to prestige um obviously the irish brigade are wasted at this battle because they're penned into a village of Oberglau, uh the garrison commander there just refusing to let them out because he's pa- he, he's panicked essentially so i think 12 battalions or something ridiculous like that are bottled up in this village it's a complete misstep mm. and when they're trying to fall back that's when they're really given a chance to i suppose flex their muscles and they disavow the, the musket and just use the bayonet and they smash through uh, one of the British regiments to the point where afterwards a captured officer is talking to um, the British commander of the regiment. I think it was Otwell's or Orkney's, one of the two. Oh, he, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Not help>. Sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, uh, he says that, um, you know, uh, oh, you were the regiment that we ran into. I was like, yes, and now I have no regiment. You know, yeah. that completely wiped the wipe them off the face of the earth. They give a opportunity for the French army to escape. They carve a path. And this is it get, happens again at uh, Ramiel's. Ramier? How, how, how would one pronounce? I, I tend to say Rami, uh, Ram, Rami or Rami. Yeah. Like, the big not so, Yeah. You're the really bad one. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the terrible. Uh, again. Yeah. What are the two L's that you're not yeah, supposed to pronounce? Yeah. Well, that it's not the case. Yeah, <laughs> and um, again, the Irish Brigade are held in sort of semi-reserve, uh, and they're brought in to cover the retreat and do so admirably. 
Um, there is, I believe, at that battle, an incident where the that we discussed this uh, on the other podcast oh, yeah. with Captain Park, where he of the Royal Irish Regiment comes up against a different Irish regiment uh, in French service, and they have a musketry duel, and Park's regiment wipes the floor with them, or Parker's regiment rather, mm-hmm. uh, which I, I think is a reflection more of um, the power of platoon fire than Irish competency uh, mm-hmm. with muskets. Yeah, um, you'll see that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the shooty stick is pointless. Just use the pokey stick. Um, yeah. professional. But if one looks at the casualty returns as... Um, oh, I really should have looked up this individual's name. There is a historian who has done a lot of work in the archive in Van San in particular, but others as well. Um, and he discovered that this, 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 there is a, something of a fallacy of this where the Irish do seem to suffer a lot of their wounds or the correct proportion of their wound, wounds rather having in the side as if they were in firing line as opposed to bayonet wounds or the like. Uh, oh no, Hanrakom, that's his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's published a lot on this in the journal The Irish Sword if anyone wants to uh, give it a read. But um, it's, it's, fa- it's, it's a really fascinating analysis as it shows sort of how they fought through casualty analysis, which isn't really something you see all too often. Um, but his, his general conclusion was, yes, they did use the bayonet very effectively, but they were perfectly capable of in- exchanging fire as well. And Malplique shows that quite nicely too. Uh, they performed very well that engagement. Uh, they're positioned on one of the flanks uh, in a wood and hold it admirably throughout. And obviously Malplique is something of a Pyrrhic victory for, at best mm-hmm. for John Churchill. I would argue he technically took the field, but lost. <laughs> I, mean, I, would, I would agree. I would agree. I, but I, I, then I'm obtuse like that. I, <laughs> I don't mind twisting the wound in great generals if, if there is one to, <laughs> to, to twist. It's like, come on, this, this amount of casualties is ridiculous. <laughs> I think. And in fact, it, it, it's, it's so bad, the casualties... It's like over 30,000 men being killed or wounded on either side of Mount Plaquet. Yeah. Um, such casualties are not seen again until Fontenoy. And Fontenoy is a lower amount of casualties. Yeah. <laughs> I think a general agreement. Let's not have any more big battles after Mount uh, mm-hmm. on both sides because it was so bloody. And I think the war kind of fizzles out into siege warfare thereafter. Yeah. Uh, and... I guess it, we are trending towards the, the path towards Fontenoy, of course. But uh, it's worth mentioning they do fight in the War of the Polish Secession as well, however briefly. Uh, I can't remember the name of the engagement, but they do take part. And obviously, this isn't prestig- particularly prestigious, but you know, however. And it is in this 1730s transition, 1720s, 30s transitionary period where you have increase in the numbers of battalions and really their cementation as a key part of. Um, the French service and an acceptance that these guys are shock troops and mm-hmm. that's how we'll use them. Okay. Yeah, it kind of fits into the whole doctrine. Yeah, which is with the French love anyway. So yeah. <laughs> how the French decide who is the shock troop and who isn't, I don't understand really. But um it's expendable. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. If it, we're all shock troops, but if there's a really bad point in the battle, the Irish are going there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Or the uh the Fire extinguisher, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, Irish fire extinguisher. I wonder what that is in French. Anyway, um, I do know that before we start to get on to actual Fontenoy, that obviously as time goes on by the 1740s, you're not looking so much at uh, what you're talking about, the homogenous, um, it's purely Irish regiments anymore. And it's, it's the same with the Scottish regiments in, Irish, in um, French service as well. Most of them just have Scottish names um, amongst the officers anyway. Um, is that the case with the Irish? Yeah, to, uh, more or less. Um, the officer corps, it's a bit, bit more dynastic. So you have, uh, for example, with Clare's regiment, um, named after Viscount Clare, it's the O'Brien family through and through. I believe one other individual takes over briefly, but for the most part, it is the O'Brien uh, clan who will lead that regiment. Clan's probably not the right word, family. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's that's reflected elsewhere as well. Uh, Mount Cashel turns into Bukele, but however, on the whole, you've got uh, continuity there. In the ranks, though, difficulties of supply, uh, of course, with um, 
bringing Irishmen out <laughs> is really difficult uh, because not only does the army in Ireland become a lot more competent when it comes to shutting down these recruiters, but there's also, as I said, decreased demand or supply among the Irish who are willing to go abroad. So you do see a trend towards a little bit more French, Swiss sneaking in, Germans as well. That being said, though, there's still majority Irish. And mm-hmm. again, that's reflected in a lot of the casualty analysis done by O'Hanrick on. Mm-hmm. I don't think you have the same um, loss of Irishness until probably the Seven Years' War or that kind of period. But mm-hmm. by 45, they're still primarily Irish. And I think that, I guess that's where a lot of the, the mythology stands a little bit better because they are still, to the most part, or for the most part, mm-hmm. Irish. I guess. Mm-hmm. And think. this is something I'm always curious about because I know in Highland regiments there is actually a slightly a slight language problem when it comes to giving orders that officers would be selected uh, because they could uh, speak Gaelic and English. Um, is that a similar problem with the Irish regiments? And obviously it would have to be French and Irish. Yeah. Well, the the um, the French isn't so much of a problem because while the dynasty is being maintained, the dynasty now lives in France. <laughs> so they are being raised in France, and you do see a gradual uh, uh, francophone, or like they, they, their names become more francophone as they go forward. Um, I mean, the, the, one of the most famous ones is um, Arthur Lally, who uh, becomes De Lally Tolandal, or you know, which is so he takes or gets a barony as a result of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so you do see this transition towards more Frenchness. Uh, they'll all still speak Gaelic. Uh, they'll, they'll speak English as well, but most of the letters are written in French. Mm-hmm. So most of the and I guess, I guess they'd be responding to French orders from a French drill manual? Uh, yes, for the most part. I don't think there's any kind of autonomy in drill or anything like that, because they're still expected to conform. They're, mm-hmm. Okay, the equipment's red, but mm-hmm. uh, the muskets are Charlotte. French, yeah. <laughs> Excellent stuff. It must have been quite a thing that you're, you're giving French battle orders to a bunch of... Uh, Mostly Gaelic speaking Irishman. <laughs> that must have been interesting. Look uh, that gap. That's all you Yeah. Mean. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it happened in the in the French Foreign Legion all the time. Anyway, well, you, they had to learn. You have to learn. To this day, you know, you have to learn French if you're from somewhere else. So it's yeah. it's the case. And uh, I mean, obviously, the the Gurkhas as well. They have to learn English. And British officers have to learn Nepalese. And these. This is one of the the richness of some of these types of. Uh, of, of units in history, but I think that gives us a good enough picture of the of, of the Irish Brigade, so we can now start talking about Fontenoy. Um, where to start, of course, is, I guess it's just a brief rundown of, of why it happens. Um, as you said in the last uh, in the in the in the what the team the, the team talk with with Marcus for history hack, it's to do with the Austrian su- succession and the and no and and various people in. Europe not liking the pragmatic option of uh, of uh, of having a, a female uh, of the House of Habsburg take over uh, the uh, the throne, and her name was what Marie Therese, was it? Marie Therese, yeah. yeah. Who is a weapon of a human, and well worthy <laughs> of it. And Alan, she's fantastic. Um, I mean, what she what she manages to achieve despite the pressure from, I suppose, Frederick and all these other people is, is incredible. But in those early years, she, as, I, as I said, as I said, as I said in the history uh, hack episode, it's very much hawk circling a wounded animal. I mean, the problem really uh, stems back to her father, who spent so long trying to secure the pragmatic sanction that he completely neglected every other element of his treasury because so much of it was going on foreign uh, negotiations. So you know, he promises France uh, a couple of some territory. He promises Prussia some territories. Promises Russia, you know, a non-aggressive pact and all these other uh, agreements that he makes, and most of them are reneged on. No one really uh, follows through. Um, so as a result of this everyone just closes in and Frederick, it's really Frederick's fault because he just through Mulvitz and these other battles that he fights in the first Silesian war, he just humiliates um, the Austrian army and shows those issues or really highlights them. Uh, France sees this opportunity, marches in. Britain at this stage, I guess, I mean, I could be wrong here, but I imagine it's more of an, in an effort to defend territory in Northern Germany as it is 
Uh, I, I presume so, unless there's some sort of um, uh, existing pact with with the Emperor of Austria. But I'm, I would presume it's mostly to safeguard um, Hanover. <laughs> yeah. Uh, based on where the Fontenoy and Dettingen and the others take place, I suppose it must be. Because, mm. uh, I mean, it's not like they get to Austria. No. Um, <laughs> because they're stopped at Fontenoy. They're, they're stopped <laughs> quite dramatically. Um, because after a while, you get a guy appearing in the French army called Marsh Marshal de Saxe. And this, this, this boy here, this lad, this he mad lad. lad. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. You like, see his portrait. That's yeah. a lad. <laughs> yeah. um, that is the face of a guy who won a battle like we're going to talk about. But um, he, uh, he, he decides on a strategy. And there's some great moments between him and the king as well. Uh, it's like he, he decides on a strategy that he wants to take the, in quotes, Austrian Netherlands. Uh, or at least, you know, secure the north, northern sort of north, north, um, northeastern border of France. Uh, he thinks that's where the war that can be can be won, and so he goes sets out to besiege Tournai. Uh, and, and in so doing, one of those little moments with the king was like he he said, the king asked, he, he gave him his plan, and the king was like, okay, so how many regiments do you how, how many how much how much do you need to do this? And he gives him this ridiculous list. I need like 120 regiments. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the king is like, well, all right, if we, you can do that. You can have the royal guard. I'll tag along. Let me know when the battle starts. And and Tournai is, is the reason the battle happens. Sisax goes in, very large army, 50,000 men odd, I think. And he, he sets up around Tournai. And what I love about Sisax is that he it's just a master class in like uh, just sort of anticipation and preparation for what is bound to come because he he besieges Tonai and then immediately he's like looking around sort of the entire area looking at the routes into it looking where the duke of cumberland's army the pragmatic army which is a great name for an army yep. uh, <laughs> uh the pragmatic army is going to be coming from and then he, he decides on three three places he could fight a battle and he sort of ticks off he crosses off the ones that he deems are illogical due to various considerations and it's sort of a weird piercing insight into the psychology of the duke of cumberland and the and the british high command um but the the cumberland just does not have over his own army even he doesn't understand it as well as well as de sax understands it yeah and he chooses fontenoy as the place where there's this ridge running, a nice, a nice uh, east-west ridge, I think, running uh, along parallel to the the Chemin de Mont, and uh, he just fortifies the heck out of it, yeah. and then just sort of lays a gauntlet down and says, "All right, all right, Augustus, come at me, come get some." <laughs> yeah. I, as you say, it's it's a defensive masterclass. I mean, it it is not dissimilar to nailing Wellington to his ridge. I mean, he's got the wooded, very wooded, secure flank behind which he can hide, say, 6,000 Irishmen, if he mm -hmm. were so wished. Any open areas, he, on um, Bagration, eat your heart out. He installs yeah. these uh, uh, defensive strong points. He fortifies the villages. I mean, he, he knows what he's doing. And although he does tend to get a bit of a joker's rap for his uh, salacious personal life, and... <laughs> He is wheeled around in a cart because he's suffering from dropsy at this stage quite badly. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, at the same time, it's it's really really well done. It is. It's, it's another yet again a masterclass of defense in depth. Yeah. He um, plans it out really well. Unlike the Russians at Borodino, he absolutely makes sure his artillery, which is somewhat inferior actually to that of the of the pragmatists. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, who are a collection, by the way, of German states and Dutch and British and, and other, other colourful sort of little nations that have yeah. cobbled together to, to fight uh, to fight the French and raise the siege of Tournai. Um, he, uh, yeah, he, he, he utilises the ground really well. He fortifies it where it's weak. He just has reserves all over the place. He's even got reserves way back at the siege lines in case he needs them. 
And he's also prepared actually to fight on the other two places he doesn't think the British are going to come at. Um, but, uh, but, but, but they don't because it's the Duke of Cumberland. And the Duke of Cumberland is like a 20-odd-year-old prince. Bulldog. Yeah, who, who just... who I'm suspicious it was just like, you say the King of France and the Dauphin are with the army? Well, I must fight them and we'll have a royal battle. <laughs> yeah, I, I think... Well, it's worth... Credit where it's due, Louis the Fifteenth is, and I don't want to get this wrong. Last French king to lead an army in battle. I th- yeah, I think he. Yeah, he must be. I think I mean, he unless, must be. Yeah. Well, I don't unless, think this, you know. I don't isn't. think Louis the Sixteenth did. When did he have a chance? I mean, yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons why Louis the Sixteenth is sort of not demasculated, but he's mm-hmm. sort of frowned upon as at least you know Louis the Fifteenth mm-hmm. did <laughs> take yeah. the battlefield at some stage. I mean he. He does nothing, but no, uh, it's, it's well, there. Well, well, he does something very important, I think, actually, because what well, I mean, first of all, he 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 says, "My my dear, my dear Marshal, uh, please have my carriage because you're obviously very ill." You know, that's Which nice. Is nice um, and he also says, he also does the, the 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 sensible king thing because he on the battlefield is actually the ranking officer. You know, it's his army, his nation. They're all his. They're all his responsibility. So he says to the court and all the assembled generals, "I am the king in Versailles, but in the field, I'm just another one of de Saxe's soldiers." So you take your orders from him. Yeah. And then de Saxe is just thrilled by this, and you know, very, very grateful for it. And um, he he places the king in the rear at a place where he can watch everything, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> he got a good view. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so one of the key uh, the key moments for this battle, uh, the struggle for I mean, well, first of all, actually, there's the ridiculous deployment phase where it takes all day. <laughs> yeah, and Cumberland just can't get his men into position for hours, and the French artillery are firing until their guns overheat. <laughs> Yeah, because it this, takes so long. I think most of the du- of the Dutch presence at this battle is on horseback, and they spend most of the battle being shot at by cannons, sitting in the open, waiting for everyone else to form up. It is shambolic how long it takes. I, I think you're talking like six until maybe two in the afternoon or something like that. Yeah. It's just hours of cannon fire. And as you said, this is a cannon that should be inferior, but yet the other cannon hasn't been deployed yet. And yeah. Uh, firing into enclosed positions so it's just a mess it's so shambolic because there's like three phases to it i mean cumberland wants to hit fontenoy he wants to hit the french right and he also wants to hook re- no french left and he wants to hook around their left through a very large forest the guys in the forest under general i think his name is inglesby um he he's very timid takes him ages to get into position and then he doesn't want to attack when he does get into position and Cumberland tries to micromanage things, goes badly. Then the guys in the center, uh, the center and like, versus the French left, I believe, just they, they, it gets so clogged in front of each other that the cavalry are in front, and then the cavalry need to get back because they're in the way of the infantry, and the guns are behind the infantry, and the guns need to be brought forward in order to just protect the infantry, and it takes hours. And then the Dutch attack. And to say the least, it, it doesn't go too well. No, uh, it's very swift. I think would be a nice way of putting it. Uh, <laughs> uh, repelling of the the Dutch presence. I mean, the Dutch do. They're blamed. I think they're they are scapegoated quite heavily by Cumberland mm-hmm. afterwards. Uh, but the Dutch army at this stage isn't that bad. I, no, I just no. think they're given orders that are almost impossible to follow. No, because like we said before, De Sachs has planned this out, and he has multiple angles of. Uh, of, of of vision on the fields in front of Fontenoy. He's made sure his cannons have crossfire and enfilade positions, and the Dutch get ripped apart. There's no infantry in the world that is going to be able to do the job, really, yeah. to be honest. So uh, poor General Valdeck is, is not totally to blame, because he does try again with similar results. And this is where you get the famous ex, uh, ex, um, exploits of the, of the Black Watch, um, where they support that attack. And it's interesting that this battle is quite fam- is very famous for the part of the Irish play in it. 
And I first heard about it because my Scottish grandfather was very proud of uh, telling me about the exploits of the Black Watch, who, uh, you know, they, they storm a bit of the defences and take them, but then they get trapped in a trench, essentially, and have to retreat. Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a story of a claymore-wielding Scotsman cutting down seven or eight before mm-hmm. he's eventually felled. Because, um, as, as you mentioned, um, they, they fight in a different style, um, which seems to work <laughs> quite well. Uh, yep, they, uh, they resort to their broadswords and they, they manage to get a lodgment, but uh, they're a bit faster than everybody else. And uh, uh, I think the Hanoverian Brigade, which is supposed to be supporting them, just can't catch them in time to, uh, to, to do anything meaningful. Yeah, again, this isn't the Hanoverians. The no, no. These are, these are competent troops. Oh, yeah. you know, these are fairly veteran. So uh, I think one thing that sometimes people gloss over in this battle is that it's very easy to pin the blame on Cumberland's allies, but the army he's leading is fine. <laughs> there is no real sort of weak link no, in it. It's not this... the Wellington where you, oh, the Dutch Belgians are you know, poor soldiers or what have you. This is fairly, okay, it's not homogenous, but at the same mm-hmm. time, it's it's a proven fighting force. It is. Uh, I think Wellington would have killed to have this army at Waterloo, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Would have murdered somebody to have this army. <laughs> It's all um, <laughs> yeah, they're all such they're all such good quality troops. It just isn't fair. But uh, and and I think you're right. I mean, people do blame the Dutch. Not their fault. There's no way they could have taken that place. I think, um, not without the help of a lot more men, anyway, uh, and a, and a concerted, um, synchronized attack, which just did not work. Um, the way it was supposed to happen. Uh, and you have this ridiculous embarrassment thing where the British and Hanoverians have to pull out of their grand flanking maneuver and form up in this just massive block uh, opposing the French left. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and it's important, I think it's important also, like you were saying, you can't blame the allies because Cumberland put most of his faith in the British infantry anyway. Yeah, that, that column is primarily British and Hanoverian. I, I mean, to, to, I, I suppose if you do want to give Cumberland the slightest bit of credit, he does verbally abuse Inglesby for, <laughs> for being very lethargic in his attack. But at the same time, uh, too little, too late. Yeah. And uh, he had some very good advisors with him. He had uh, General, uh, how do you pronounce this? Is it Lijne? Lijanye? Uh, maybe. Yeah, uh-huh. he's, he, he's um, Scottish, as far as I know. His name is cropped up in my. Uh, his, uh-huh. his regiments were based in Ireland at one point. Indeed, yeah. yes, and also um, uh, the uh, it, there's a couple of uh, familiar faces from Culloden there as well. General Hawley is is there in, in charge of a dragoon brigade, I believe. And uh, yeah, it, this army is is recognisably that of the 1740s that fought from Scotland to the United States, that as it became. So um, this column which doesn't start out as a column but becomes a column because ha- it has to like squeeze through a gap between Fontenay and the Bois de Berry. Yeah. And they come up against the French line. Now, de Sachs doesn't actually want them to break through or anything like that. This isn't part of his plan, but he is, uh, there's one of his officers comes to him after um, they repulse the Dutch a second time and he, and he congratulates him very cordially on his victory. And Isaac says, um, well, it's not quite over yet because those fellows over there uh, are going to be a little tougher to digest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, this this mass of troops trudges up this hill under, it should be said, fairly withering cannon fire uh, because they're advancing between two defensive positions here. Uh, again, if you want to draw any parallels to Waterloo, this is very much the old guard going in um, oh. and under a lot of cannon fire, and they come up at the, at the head of them is the uh, the foot guards, uh, British guard regiments, and their first speed bump, I suppose, are the French foot guards. And there's this famous exchange that takes place uh, that Voltaire um, s- made a rough approximation of in his history of it. Um, I think in Voltaire's version, there's a um, the Br- a British. Uh, commander is supposed to have drunk whiskey or uh, scotch or something in the face of the French and says, you know, 
we shall not fire first, you shall fire first, or I salute you on this day, but you must fire first or something like that. Uh, there might have been a verbal exchange back and forth that did take place, but uh, it was probably much shorter. It's something along the lines of, you know, the guard doesn't shoot first, you shoot first, and then they shot first, you know. Yeah. Uh, again, it's all uh, probably retroactive. I, but I've, I've heard that it was uh, like a captain of uh, Captain Hay of the, of the first guard, who came out and I mean there are ver various versions of it like you say I mean there's even various versions of what he says some yeah. of it's like something really complicated like we will make you swim the whatever river it is behind Fontenoy like we like we made you um like like we made you uh, uh swim the river at Dettingen um and 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 then drinks their health and walks away and then the other one is that the French guy comes forward and 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 polite and they have a, a very polite argument about who should fire first because it's you know it's like opening a door oh please after you yes, uh, yeah. because the first volley is always the best <laughs> um, I believe regardless of who says what the French do fire first the British then mm -hmm. take twenty paces and then shoot which I think is cheating <laughs> um, but uh, well it, that's the platoon firing working again there I think Andy because their first platoons fire. And then they march forwards to like within 40 paces of them. And the other two platoons, so the majority of the muskets, then fire. Yeah. And it's the casualties are appalling if they're anywhere close to <laughs> correct. <laughs> the, the French Guard Regiment is dec Well, I, I don't use decimated because that actually has a numerical value. But they're very badly beaten up as a result and break. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I mean, if if they're, the trash talk about Dettingen was what he said, he I mean they did follow through. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the Sax obviously sees this and corrects and saying he rushes men into the gap, um, and he deploys a line of French soldiers, I believe, who also evaporate. I, I, yeah. Well, it's really it's really kind of interesting because the Sax has to um, uh, what is what's the word I'm looking for? He has to improvise another defense to stop this attack and Cumberland sort of stops and starts because he he kind of he after he breaks the guard he has a decision do I press on or do I sort of spread out he decides to press on and de Sachs, to his credit poor guy really ill does get on his horse and I think it's it's equated actually that he does spend quite a few hours on that horse riding around doing stuff yeah. Um, so how, his energy, how, where he got the energy from, I have no idea. I mean, I read a weird thing about him sucking on a musket ball to quench his, to keep his thirst down um, through the day. But uh, out of the funny things like that, so he spends his day out of a carriage, onto a horse, exhausted, you know, <laughs> <laughs> trying to reorganize the line. Um, I believe that pretty, pretty much kind of, to kind of... Um, summarize it the column makes great a pretty good progress um into the french position uh and it 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 it, it sort of swats away everything that comes at it and yep. that is by this point multiple cavalry charges launched by the french reserves and there's, at this point, de Sachs has actually, but, but, but by this point, the French cavalry have bought enough time for de Sachs to start bringing in flanking forces of infantry. And the, the British also now have the Masson du Bois in front of them, which is obviously the best cavalry in France and stuff like that. And so and they're still being hit from all sides by artillery fire. Yes. Um, and de Sachs rides back to where he's left the king. And... All of the courtiers and stuff are losing their minds because they're thinking, if that's the British infantry in front of us, we can't stop them. They're going to come and capture the king. And, I mean, what do you, have you read about this or not? He's supposed to have gone up to the king and sort of dismounted and bowed and everything. And when the king has told him they're telling me to leave, he sort of said, and, and, and he's sort of supposed to have turned around to, his, to the rest of the court and said, and which one of you bleeps <laughs> told him that <laughs> yeah I, I think the conversation kind of boils down to yeah but wait watch this <laughs> yeah because <laughs> he's, he's got his the pieces are in place you know the the, the ch chessboard has been properly rigged the, and he's I, I guess sacrificing his cavalry at this stage just to buy time yeah. but 
it has bought time and now he's ready to go. So I would absolutely believe that. Because <laughs> yeah. he, he takes the king. As well. Yeah, I know. He's, he, he was definitely capable of like telling these, these courtiers and the Duke de Richelieu uh, where to go. Um, uh, because he had a lot on the line, nobody really liked him except the king. Uh, and he takes the king off, doesn't he, uh, to sort of, apart from the staff, and sort of guides his telescope. And he shows him where all the pieces are coming together. And then his, the telescope light, comes to rest on the, on the guard cavalry, and he says, and he politely asks the king's permission to use it. And then, but then more crisis, because the French army is the French army. It's led by a bunch of hot-blooded aristocrats. And most of them want the honor of breaking the British line. And there's a bunch of unordered attacks, which makes things even more perilous. But it, it holds together. I mean, a lot of cavalry die, but it has its purpose, like you said. Sacrifice of the cavalry does kind of halt that blinking, <laughs> blinking column. Yeah. This juggernaut. And then by this point, one of the one of the formations that has been wheeled around from its position in the Wadavari, behind the Wadavari, and brought against the the British right flank, I believe, yep. is the quite large, I might say, uh, Irish brigade. Yeah, uh, you're talking about six thousand men, I think, at this point. Um, completely fresh, haven't been used mm -hmm. at all. They have spent the evening sunning themselves. Um, they march out to the sound of ill and pipes. Um, it's probably quite stirring, actually, I imagine, mm. um, as they come out from behind these woods. Uh, they don't obviously do it alone. As you mentioned, there are other regiments deployed, including Swiss um, Swiss infantry. Uh, and then, as you, said, as you mentioned, some fairly elite cavalry regiments. But it's the Irish who take a lot of the credit for what comes next, because whilst the other regiments uh, tackle the column with musketry, the Irish don't. Um, they... They're told, allegedly, one of the officers tells them, do not fire until your bayonet is in his belly. <laughs> so that's the order given. And they charge forward, bayonets fixed. And again, the cry is raised, allegedly, uh, remember Limerick and Saxon treachery, ask Gwelga. And in, on St. Patrick's Day, my Gwelga really should be good enough to pronounce that. But it's uh, quivnoch limnoch August. Uh, I can't remember the Saxon perfidery bit. <laughs> um, but It's in it's, the book. It's in the book. It's somewhere in there. Um, but uh, so, yeah, they, they launch this bayonet charge. Um, they do in take a volley going in. Um, and in the process, uh, one of the commanding officers of the regiment, Dylan, is killed by a musket ball. And Viscount Clare, who's leading his regiment, is dehorsed. Now, he had been told that morning, please wear a carass. Uh, so he did. And I guess it did save his life. But the regiment the first ranks of the regiments uh, take a full volley from this column and do suffer pretty hor horrific casualties but they press the attack uh, bayonet fixed and I suppose there might have been a psychological element to this as well and that's what a lot of the Irish historians like to really put forward this idea of shock troops but also the fear factor that the British would have been aware of these men in red coats and these, these flags that they would have carried so similar to theirs so there would have been that sort of oh god it's the Irish uh, much the same, <laughs> hopefully, on a rugby pitch today. Um, <laughs> but they launch this attack, and then one of the French cavalry regiments helpfully charges them in the back, thinking they are British. <laughs> but uh, cries of Vive la France, um, uh, Vive mm -hmm. le Roy, eventually persuade them these are, in fact, Irish regiments, but set that aside. There's a, there's a lot of confused French cavalry riding around trying to be heroic at the second. It's, it's very confusing for everybody. And there's uh, also French, uh, confused more because there are French white-coated infantry of the Normandy Brigade, I believe, running around as well. So they're just going to look all the more British. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, mess. look, look, those red coats are running away. We should chase them down. <laughs> but despite this, these, this, these heroics, um, the Irish Brigade managed to stall the column. They don't push it back, though, but they are the first thing to really stop it in its tracks. Uh, and their commanding officer, who is a man called Dalali Tollendal, who is later guillotined, um, he's scapegoated for losing India, um, as a matter of fact. But this is his finest hour. He's the first, or it's either he or Claire is the first non-Frenchman to be made a marshal. Mm. Uh, I must 
double check that. I believe it's uh, Dalali Talamdal though. Okay. Uh, for the, his efforts at this battle, but the, the, they've done it. The column has stopped, but now you need to roll it back. And this is where, again, your perspective as a historian comes in, because if you listen to or read some of the newer, more pro-British histories, it's an orderly retreat. If you read a 19th century Irish historian, it's a rout. <laughs> um, so it, really what happens afterwards mm -hmm. is open to interpretation. I don't know what you think of what takes place. It's very difficult to say because, I mean, first of all, I should also mention to the viewers that because of the way the Irish Brigade hit the column, what they hit were the three guards' regiments. So uh, I think uh, Dylan's regiment went bang smack into the first foot guards um, and threw them back, basically. Um, or at least, you know, there was a pause. Well, we have to come apart and it's like okay we have stopped now <laughs> <laughs> we have definitely stopped and there is a lot of frenchmen around um because the problem is now what you have is what what is is known as what is it local superiority of force mm. that column is about sixteen thousand men strong true at its height uh, with about another uh five thousand men way back that can't get into the fight it's got a narrow front as well so only about I don't know, four, five regiments, six regiments wide can, can actually be engaged at any one time. Meanwhile, this axe is now going to throw about 38,000 men uh, towards it from multiple sides because he can. And yeah, I mean, the, the French cavalry come forward again now as the, as the British are staggered and they can't make any more headway. Uh, hmm. What was the nature of the retreat? Hmm. I suppose if one looks at the casualties, I, I can understand why the orderly retreat mm -hmm. theory bears out, bears out. Uh, because I, with that much cavalry in the field, a rout would have been slaughter. Yeah. Especially, yeah, I mean, I, I don't imagine the Maison de Roy would have taken too kindly to it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, think so. I think, yeah, if, if they actually broke, then, I mean, all those French cavalry, and the, you're not, you know, the, that would have been, you know, the... The Garde de Corps, the Musketeers, the Grenadiers of Cheval, the Cuirassiers, they're all going to be wanting some vengeance for getting shot to pieces during this advance. So that's not going to be pretty. I, I also think that the sheer mass of troops concentrated there is actually going to make it quite hard to actually break it. I mean, these are good quality troops as well. I mean, it's true, they're not breaking through. And de Sachs was right for knowing that these guys aren't invincible and we can stop them. Everybody just calm down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they, are the, they, are, they have proven themselves to be excellent at what they do, which is just shooting their muskets really well. So it's very possible that they were able to extract themselves under, under pretty heavy pressure, I would assume, um, until they could get to where the cavalry were. I think this is also a big problem with Cumberland's kind of gambit to just crash through. Is his cavalry are stuck behind like three or four rank lines of of infantry, so yeah. he can't get them forward to exploit any of these um, successes that his first line has been making. And I mean, I presume to be honest that the the guards' regiments, the British guards' regiments, must have been pretty low on ammunition by this point as well. To be honest, um, so I, I, I guess. I guess it can't have ended any other way than a um, an orderly retreat, to be honest, because, like you say, otherwise it would have been utterly catastrophic in terms of... They, just surely, they surely would have captured um, Cumberland himself, to be honest, if, if it had been a, 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 a total rout. Yeah. Uh, perhaps it comes down as well to uh, so much pressure has been applied all over the battlefield that maybe there's a degree of restraint in case they attack somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, colours are taken. It, it, this is mm -hmm. still quite a humiliating sort of, mm -hmm. uh, setback. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't fully buy into some of the traditional Irish narratives mm -hmm. surrounding throwing them back into the sea. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think it's probably something close. It's one of those really confusing things about military history, like what on earth is a retreat under these circumstances, you know? It would be quite possible for the ranks to be so really disordered and thrown back, but not broken because 
they could because there were a lot of formed regiments behind them um, and stuff like that. So even if you break them, you know that you can't actually pursue them because there's more behind them. So the French, like you say, the pursuit would have had other co sort of considerations to do with it. And uh, yeah, like you say, but colors were taken, prisoners were taken, uh, very heavy casualties in that column. They do have to retreat under fire. Um, and the entire thing is a fiasco and a great display of tactical prowess from from de Sachs and his and his generals. You know, the Irish Irish commanders ride, ride, come forward and they throw the standard at the feet of the king. And de Sachs has specifically mounted his horse again to ride up to the king and, uh, you know, sweeps off his hat and he says, I give you victory, sire, as if he's just ordered it at a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> victory with a side of english color yeah um, this is it's a it's a massive win i mm. mean it, it, this is one of the largest pitch battles i it's it well it's not as large as blenheim but it's it like still, hundred thousand men over yeah. hundred thousand men each as in like from on, on on the field yeah i mean okay yes it takes them about three and a half years to get engaged with one another <laughs> um, but <laughs> Nonetheless, this is a, a major engagement, and it's one that tends to just be glossed over. And I think one of the reasons for that is because the war itself is fairly inconsequential for the participants of this battle. Mm -hmm. I mean, for England, War of the Austrian Secession is something of a non-thing. Uh, I guess if you're Prussian or Austrian, it's a very serious thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially if you live in Silesia. For France, I mean... It, it, it's status quo maintained. They take a couple of towns around the Netherlands and life goes on. So I guess because the war is kind of, they shouldn't really have been there in the first place. I guess that explains why the battle is kind of forgotten because it's not decisive, I suppose. Oh. Or maybe it is. It. it ends the field. I, don't know. I, I think, I mean, it, it's definitely a, a convincing, a proper victory, no doubt. I mean, certainly Wellington won similar victories where he just re repulses the enemy attacks. He is left with the field. Also the strategic imperative because Cumberland then has to retreat. They, they don't re relieve Tournai. Tournai falls. And I mean, Fontenoy in, in, a, in a way is, is kind of, I guess, almost the last hurrah of the French Royal Army in a way, to be honest. It's, it's, a, it's the most notable big victory they get. Um, until the Seven Years' War, when it all goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a brief moment of, of, of hope in North America where they, where they kick some butt, but uh, with, their scrappy, with their scrappy woodsmen and stuff like that and their, and their, and their Native American allies. But it's, yeah, Fontenoy, I think, marks a particular... For mi French military history, it's, it's probably just famous for that fact that it, we won against the British. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know... I, I enjoy mocking the French as much as anybody else for losing to the British, but uh, I, I do, I do, uh, I do, you know, I, I, I tire of the, <laughs> I tire of the whole we're better than the French thing as well, and so Fontenoy is quite refreshing to read about in a way. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting also what you said about the war of the Austrian succession. It's not a war that registers at all. Um, not many people even know that the 45 rebellion, uh, with Charles Edward Stuart and all that malarkey, is essentially an offshoot of it. Yeah, and it, I suppose if we're going to be talking about the Irish Brigade's sort of role in that, um, it, the plan is to support that uh, uprising with an invasion. And Viscount Clare uh, is told, you will command this force. And they, they are in uh, Normandy at one stage training, ready to sort of move to a port and then uh, invade. But uh, I suppose Cumberland gets lucky, <laughs> and um, it's just... yeah. I mean, they get, yeah. For, uh, he didn't, wasn't facing De Sachs in um, in Scotland or, or anything like that, and they turned around at Derby, and the French were left with like, well, are we invading or not? Well, no, they've gone back to Scotland for heaven's sake. What are we supposed to do now? I mean, yeah. I'm sure six thousand Irishmen would have been very helpful. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, I, they would have been delighted, I imagine, to invade. Um, 
the only invasion of Ireland that does take place in this period, if you ignore the 1790s, which I tend to, uh, because it's uh, it's just a whole different kettle of fish altogether, which is very difficult to deal with, is uh, Thoreau's little foray into Carrickfergus, where he captures the town and is then paid off with a vast ransom of tobacco and cows and butter and other <laughs> provisions. And he's, uh, he's, he's eventually killed off the Isle of Man. Um, there is no invasion of Ireland to restore the monarchy. As you mentioned earlier, the French contribution to the 45 is fairly minimal. Um, and I mean, you one could say what a lot of hot air over nothing. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. As, as much as this is the high point of the French, uh, of the Irish Brigade, or the French army, it's also the high point of the Irish Brigade and French service. Um, mm-hmm. After this, you do see a loss of Irishness in their ranks. Um, trends downwards. They participate in the Seven Years' War, primarily in the European theatre, um, th- th- of very little note. Nothing really spectacular takes place. Uh, and towards the end of sort of the royal uh, period generally, they are disbanded. Uh, there's a lot of suspicion surrounding them because obviously they'd fight quite hard for the French royal movement. Uh, and they're given an opportunity to join the English army. Some of them do, some of them don't. Uh, and then Napoleon obviously forms his legion as well. But that's more made up of uh, Republican chaps who had fled from 1798 afterwards. Mm-hmm. But really, after Fontenoy, it goes downhill. Mm-hmm. And that's another, uh, uh, that's interesting as well. I was I was going to ask at the beginning of this, is it actually Fontenoy or is that an Anglicism? Is it Fontenoy? Uh, I was once told by a French historian that it was Fontenoy. Um, it makes so much more sense if it's Fontenoy, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, the, the anglicization is so common. That I think, yeah, you know. it is. But it it sounds much more like a thing that should be a, like a, a town in that part of the world if it's Fontenoy, <laughs> because what is that in the French here? Fontenoy. That's not, <laughs> that's not a French word. <laughs> yeah. It's just a, a bastardization of the word fountain. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, according to. Uh, a chap called Pierre Noby, it is uh, Fontenoy. So. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Fontenoy it is at the end of this. And that's just a little reason why we both think that this is a particularly interesting and very just a cool battle to, to read about because it is, it's the Waterloo of the 18th century. It's, it's, it, there's a lot to, you could go into, um, which we don't have time to do right now. Um, but, um, with that, it's it's. I think we've run out of time. I think we've covered what we wanted to cover. Uh, Andrew, thank you for coming to talk to me about about the Irish and them them kicking some kicking some perfidious Saxon butt. <laughs> I, I will always and forever talk about the Irish, if possible. If you want to talk about the fighting 69th next week, I'm happy to do that too. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there could be a whole series in this, to be honest. But <laughs> I was just talking about various, various Irish people killing people uh, for for various countries. But uh, this one has been a particular favourite of mine because I I, um, uh, I don't get to, to talk about the Battle of Fontenoy because nobody talks about the Battle of Fontenoy, uh, which is which is which is boring. Everybody sense our enthusiasm for the subject and and. You know, go read about it yourself. <laughs> uh, if, if I can recommend a book, um, Stephen McGarry's book on the Irish Brigade. Uh, that's very good. Mm-hmm. And yes. uh, uh, there's a couple of others as well. I can send you a, if you want to. I can send you a reading list. <laughs> that's fine. I, you can send me the reading list, and I will I will actually put it in the description box below. Where as well, you can find Andrew's uh, social media links and such like that. If you want to, if you want to follow him, see what he's up to. Uh, most of them, I'm afraid, will probably transition into stand-up comedy as the world opens up. Uh, but if you like laughing, that'll do too. <laughs> we all we all need a bit of we all need a bit of uh, I think a bit of laughter. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right, thank you. That was great. excellent. Yeah. So, thank you everybody for watching. Um, please do all the things you're supposed to do at the end of the video. Tell me that you liked it. Any questions, drop them in the comments below, etc. 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 YouTube words. Um, as I've been saying to everybody, you know, at the end of these videos, have courage and have compassion. Godspeed. And I uh, will see you again <laughs> for the next video. There we go.